الحكومية ماريا بانشينكو عن القضايا إن كانت جناية أو جنحة أو إذا كانت فاميلي لو <تصفيق> ونهار التنين متكلم مع المحامي سام سيف اليوم مستضيفين اثنيناتهم المحامية ماريا بانشينكو والمحامي سام سيف لأنه اليوم لح نحكي عن موضوع اضطرقنا له هير اند ذير بس مش بطريقه متعمقه جدا ما بعرف اذا رح نضطر نستعمل الساعه كلها بس بدنا نحكي اليوم وبدنا نشارك المستمعين بتاثير اوقات المشاكل الجنائيه او مشاكل الجنحة للشخص اللي عنده اقل من التجنس للشخص اللي هو بعده غير مواطن امريكي وكمان رح نحكي عن فاميلي لا اذا انسان بده يقدم انولمنت انسان بده يقدم طلاق كاستدي ايشوز وهل ممكن تاثر بطريقه سلبيه على الاميجريشن ستاتس تبع هذا الانسان كمان مره اللي عم يتسمعوا علينا اللي صاروا متجنسين هذا ما بيتطبق عليهم لانه صاروا متجنسين بس اي انسان عم بيتسمع علينا اليوم الاميجريشن ستاتس تبعه اقل من ناتشرالايزد ناتشرالايزد سيتيزن رح يهمه يتسمع عن الموضوع وان شاء الله يا رب ما يتطبق عليه ما بنتمنى لا جنحه ولا جنايه لاي انسان وما بنتمنى ولا طلاق ولا هجره ولا قصد ديسبيوت لاي انسان بس نعرف انه الحقيقه بالواقع انه هيدي اشياء بتصير. So today we're talking about the interaction between immigration law and family law and between immigration law and criminal law. We're only talking to those who are less than US citizens. We're talking to those who are less than naturalized. We're talking to anybody who has a green card, anybody who's here on a visitor visa, on a work visa. Uh, maybe an asylee. Um, there could be all kinds of other visas I cannot think of right now. Um, when, when attorney Maria Penchenko, who is a criminal law attorney and a family law attorney, gets a client, and one of the first questions she asks, and I think it is even in the interview form, is, are you a U.S. citizen? When the answer comes, anything less than yes, then she immediately asked them to get in contact with attorney Sam Safe because we want to make sure that whatever it is they want to do or whatever legal problem they are facing, especially if it's criminal, that she will not do anything that does not get the green light from attorney Sam Safe. So I think I properly framed the question, attorney Maria Penchenko, am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, Attorney Sam Saif shared with us that there is a United States Supreme Court dating to 2011, so it's almost 10 years old, that talks specifically about people who are not naturalized and who are facing criminal proceedings. Sam, can you share with us what the holding for that case, the Padilla versus Holder case is? Yes, uh, thank you, Jumana. So basically, um, uh, And case... Sam, I'm sorry to interrupt, sure. but after you talk in English, because we need to keep Maria in the loop for what you're saying, if you don't mind briefly translating it into Arabic. Sure, sure, absolutely. So basically the, the case said that whenever someone uh, has a criminal court case going on, um, and uh, they're looking to get a plea agreement that uh, the, the attorney, uh, the criminal attorney, and uh, the judge should make sure that the person knows there might be immigration consequences to taking the plea uh, that that person uh, would be taking. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it became a rule that uh, whenever uh, a criminal attorney has someone who is not a U.S. citizen, they advise them uh, or they help them find an a immigration attorney to advise them on uh, their uh, a criminal plea agreement or maybe what happens if they, if they go to trial. Uh, and the same thing would happen in court where most, uh, if not all judges, uh, especially in Michigan, would uh, uh, inform uh, the, the defendant that 
uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, possible consequences, immigration consequences, uh, if he takes the plea. Um, uh, so uh, he wants to know if the person uh, knows uh, to speak to an immigration attorney and to get advice from an immigration attorney. Uh, okay. But to, to say this in in uh, Arabic, um, كل شخص اللي عدى قضية بالمحكمة وهي كانت القضية كرايم لازم بس لنوضح ممكن تكون جنحة حتى جنحة أو جناية متهم بجنحة أو جناية صحيح صحيح هاي القضية من المحكمة العليا قالت أنه المحامي مال criminal attorney مال هذا الشخص والقاضي بهاي القضية لازم يفهمون الشخص أنه يجوز أكو إجراءات للإميغريشن إذا يعني أخذ البلي أجريمنت مالته لو إذا راح للترايل فلازم يحكي ويا محامي هجرة قبل لا يأخذ قرار على القضية نعم ولدرجة أنه من بعد هيدا الملف اللي كان قدام اليونايتد ستيتس سوبريم كورت بال 2011 بسبب ملفات سابقه ما كان القاضي اند اور محامي الكريمنال لوير عاطي نصيحه للمدعي عليه في كثير ملفات رجعوا فتحوها من جديد وذي سيت اسايد ذا كونفكشن مضبوط؟ صحيح اذا كان موجود بالقضيه انه الشخص ما أخذ استشارة محامي هجرة لو إذا القاضي لو محامي الكريمنال اترني مع الشخص ما نبه الشخص أنه يحكي ويا محامي هجرة وهذا الشخص ما كان يعرف بالكونسيكونسز اللي تصير من هاي القضية لو البلي اجريمنت اللي أخذوها يقدر بعدين يحاول يفتح القضية بهذا السبب ويبدي القضية من جديد Uh, على مود يحاول يغير البلي اجريمنت لصالحه بالاميجريشن ستاتس مالته. نعم، يعني لنوضح انه هيدا الكيس بدلا فيرسس هولدر من اليونايتد ستيتس سوبريم كورت ما بتجبر المدعي عليه يستشير محامي، بتجبر المحامي تبع المدعي عليه والقاضي تبع المدعي عليه يبلغوا المدعي عليه وقت اللي الجواب بيكون anything other than yes I am a United States citizen انه من المستحسن يستشير محامي هجرة قبل ما يدخل بأي بلي ديل ما بتجبر ولا بتفرض على المدعي عليه يستشير محامي بس بتنبهه انه يمكن يكون في عوارض سيئة وسلبية اذا ما استشار محامي هجرة قبل ما يقبل ببلي ديل معين لدرجة انه هون بمشيغن في محامي للأسف شيلوا منه رخصته لممارسة المحاماة لانه ما بلغ المدعي عليه اللي كان هو موكله انه لازم يحكي مع محامي هجرة وبهذا السبب دخل ببلي ديل معين وبسبب البلي ديل اللي دخل فيه رحلوا لبلده. So Attorney Maria Penchenko, um, Sam told us what the holding of the Padilla versus Holder is. And I want you to talk about how as a result of that. So so does, does this case force a defendant to go higher and talk to an immigration lawyer? Or is the duty rather on the criminal law attorney and on the criminal judge to say to the defendant, hey, talk to an immigration lawyer because what you're about to accept may adversely affect your immigration status? Yes, the, the holding in the case only, allow, only requires the criminal defense attorney to advise the defendant right. that he needs to consult an immigration attorney because we as criminal defense attorneys um, we don't spe specialize um, in this kind of law and we're not sure exactly what this could mean for you in your status and so the judge will also advise before taking the plea and if if, if the defendant decides not to take the advice that at that point the it's on the defendant 
for not taking the advice. But before that, it's it's up to us as as the criminal defense attorneys to make sure they know that this could potentially have a risk of affecting their status one way or another. Did you also say in preparing for the show that because of this case, or maybe both of you told me, because of the Padilla versus Holder case, that cases preceding that where the defendant was not notified, was not alerted to the need for possibly uh, consulting with an immigration uh, law attorney had their uh, convictions set aside? Well, that's it, that what has happened is, is that when that case came down and they won, and they were able to set the conviction aside due to an uh, fact that the attorney um, that assisted the defendant uh, did not warn him that he could be deported. That issue basically opened up the door, if you will, for other defendants that were affected in their immigration status in one way or another to come back to court and say, my attorney never informed me that this would have happened to my immigration status. And they're um, basically asking for their convictions to be set aside and the case to be re begin from the beginning, really. Correct. So it's they're, they're getting charged all over again and they're going through the proceedings all over again. Right. Okay. Now I want to move to why is it that when someone is charged with a crime, whether it's a misdemeanor or a, uh, a uh, uh, felony, why, why do we worry from an immigration standpoint? So attorney Sam Safe, what is the concern if someone is charged with, I don't know, one DUI versus someone is charged with fraud, someone is charged with retail fraud, uh, retail theft, uh, someone's charged with a driving ticket, uh, maybe a misdemeanor kind of, maybe leaving the scene of an accident. Should should every defendant who is less than a full-blown U.S. citizen need to worry about each and every plea deal? Or are there some plea deals that you as an immigration lawyer advise the client not to take because to take them would be to jeopardize their immigration status? Well, it's it's really on a case by case basis because it also depends on their own history as well, their own criminal history, um, and also the status that they're in. Not everybody is in the same position. A green card holder uh, is not in the same position as a, a person who's in the U.S. on a visitor visa or a student visa. Uh, a green card holder would have more rights. Uh, immigration-wise, if he commits certain crimes, then let's say a person who is here on a visitor visa. So um, it, it really all depends on a case by case. But there are some examples that um, uh, would hurt everybody across the board. Uh, uh, if uh, the person is um, uh, charged with uh, a certain type of crime and uh, convicted. Uh, of a crime that's, let's say, a felony, or it could be even a misdemeanor in some cases, where they're sentenced to jail one year or more. Um, that, uh, for the most part, uh, would be considered an aggravated felony, which can uh, get anybody deported. Um, but if we're not talking about something that big, let's uh, say we're talking about uh, smaller things, like uh, smaller misdemeanors, uh, maybe they have to do with drugs or uh, theft or a DUI. Um, uh, for instance, there are uh, various different types of uh, theft or retail fraud. Um, uh, the, the first uh, or the lowest two uh, most of the time do not affect uh, a person's immigration status that much. Uh, they could still possibly get naturalized um, and they could uh, uh, possibly, you know, uh, live their life as a green card holder without fear of being deported. But if they get a higher uh, uh, retail fraud, uh, uh, I believe it'll be like a first degree retail fraud, um, they can be deported for that. Um, if uh, somebody is caught with marijuana and it's more than 30 grams of marijuana, uh, they can be deported uh, for that. 
Uh, if somebody gets uh, a felony DUI, uh, they can possibly be deported for that. Um, if somebody gets two misdemeanor DUIs, they can get deported for that. Um, so it really, it's on a case by case basis. It depends on the person's criminal history. It depends on the crime charge. It depends on what state uh, the uh, uh, person was charged. Uh, each state has different criminal laws. Um, uh, you know, California DUI law is not the same as Michigan uh, DUI law. So, um, uh, you know, two DUIs in California might not get the person deported, but two in Michigan might. Uh, so uh, when we review or analyze each person's uh, uh, criminal history or whether they should take a plea agreement, we really need to take a look at um, uh, the, the, their criminal history, uh, where they're being charged at, the statute that uh, the government is using to charge and try to convict them, uh, the, um, uh, the actual statute that uh, they, they would take the plea under. Uh, and we put those all together and we make an assessment of the chances uh, that this person can be deported or uh, if they're eligible for naturalization and whether they would be able to apply for naturalization in the future and when, as well as whether they can travel outside the United States. Um, there are certain types of crimes that might not make someone deportable, but if they travel outside the United States, it might make them inadmissible. So they might not let them back into the U.S. if they travel outside. Such as? Uh, well, for instance, uh, uh, certain crimes involving moral turpitude, um, uh, like, uh, uh, let's say, a retail uh, theft, uh, certain retail thefts might not get someone deportable, but um, uh, a second degree uh, retail theft might make someone inadmissible. Um, or, or marijuana, certain marijuana uh, charges um, uh, can make someone inadmissible to the U.S. if they traveled outside. And again, it depends on their status. Um, if they uh, came on a student visa, they have less rights than a green card holder. So uh, that means uh, a, a, a student who travels outside and tries to come back in, if they had a charge uh, for marijuana, might not be let back in. But uh, someone who's a green card holder who leaves the U.S. and comes back before he has left for six months, uh, he will be let back in. Um, so it, it just all depends uh, on the person's situation. Okay. Uh, Sam, I'm going to ask you to translate this briefly into Arabic, but let's take a quick break just so that you can catch your breath. And we will continue with this very, very important point. And last Tuesday, we briefly discussed it on the air with Maria and we likened it Consulting with you or consulting with an immigration attorney for someone who is not a U.S. citizen yet but is facing criminal prosecution is so important. It's almost like getting clearance from your doctor before going into major surgery. It's almost like making sure you have a normal EKG and a normal blood test before the surgeon will even operate on you. So you're, you're kind of the clearance, you're kind of the cardiac clearance before the surgery. And you may give the clearance and you may not. And we will talk after the break, after you translate this into Arabic, what can Maria do sometimes when a prosecutor adamantly refuses to change the charges and she cannot reduce it to something that's appropriate, that's something that's less risky. So we'll talk about that right after the break. هل أنت بحاجة للمساعدة في جلب شريك الحياة إلى الولايات المتحدة؟ بالرغم من أن إجراءات الهجرة على أساس زواج معقدة للغاية إلا أن محامي الهجرة من مكاتب المحامية جمان كيروس تمكنوا بنجاح كبير مساعدة آلاف الأشخاص للهجرة إلى أمريكا لأن لديهم الخبرة الطويلة في مساعدة الأشخاص على الحصول على الجرين كارد على أساس زواج أو فيز الخطوبة بشكل سريع ومريح بقدر المستطاع اتصل الآن بمكاتب المحامية جمان كيروس 1-866 your rights 248-557-3645 your rights مع المحامية جمانة كيروس ونرجع على الهواء مع المحاميين اليوم ماريا بنشنكو وسام سيف عم نحكي عن تأثير 
تأثير إنسان متهم بجناية أو جنحة على على ظروفه من ناحية الإيميغريشن بالنسبة للإيميغريشن ستاتس تبعه وهل ممكن هيدا الشيء يأثر سلبيا على الإيميغريشن ستاتس تبعه ومنحكي بعد شوي عن تأثير إنسان أقل من United States citizen وحابب يقدم على طلاق أو هجرة أو قصدي وتأثيرها على الإيميغريشن ستاتس المحامي سامسيف حكيتنا بالإنجليزي وما لسي ما توخذنا نحفظ منك ترجم بالعربي هل نعم. كل تهمة جنحة أو جناية لإنسان بعد ما صار يؤس سيتزن ممكن تعرضه لخطر الترحيل؟ بعد ما صار يؤس سيتزن ما رح يتعرض للترحيل بس الشخص قبل لا يصير يو سيتيزن واذا كان موجود عده انواع فيز راح يكون تاثير عليه بالديبورتيشن التسفير لو اذا يستحق بعدين يقدم على جرين كارد راح ياثر بالمعامله جرين كارد لو اي نوع معامله ثانيه للهجره اكو تاثير لكل قضيه معظم 99% من القضايا الهجره تسال على الكريمينال هيستوري مال الاشخاص اذا كانت بداخل الولايات المتحده لو برا الولايات المتحده ولازم يكونون مؤهلين للاميجريشن بنفيت مالتهم اللي يقدمون عليها ومعظم الكريمينال ماترز ياثرون على هذن المعاملات واضافه على هذا اذا الشخص ادى ستاتس uh, um, uh, بالولايات المتحدة من ضمنهم الجرين كارد uh, نوع الكريمينال uh, حتى البلي اجريمنت يأثر على الستاتس مالتهم يأثر على تقديم الجنسية uh, يأثر على إذا يخلوهم يرجعون لداخل الولايات المتحدة ورا سفر um, فأي شخص أي شخص فشي كلش مهم uh, أدى قضية بكريمينال كورت Uh, قبل لا ياخذ بلي اجريمنت uh, قبل لا يقرر ويا الكريمينال اترني مالته uh, يريد ياخذ بلي اجريمنت لازم لازم يحكي ويا اميجريشن uh, اترني على مود يعرف شنو هي الكونسيكونسز ايش uh, راح يصير uh, ورا ما ياخذ هاي البلي اجريمنت اذا uh, هاي الجنحه لو جريمه راح تخلي الحكومه تسفره لو اذا تخليه ما يقدم للجنسيه على ورا سنه لو يجوز لازم ينتظر خمس سنين لو اذا على مده الحياه لو يجوز ما راح تخليه يسافر برا البلد يبقى عنده الجرين كارد لو الفيزا بس ما يقدر يسافر برا البلد بسبب انه يجوز ما يخلوه يرجع للولايات المتحده إذا إنسان مثلا متهم دائما حضرتك بتحكي عن crimes of moral turpitude قلت لنا بسمون CIMT CIMT crimes نعم. of moral turpitude إذا إنسان متهم ب retail fraud مستحيل وهو أقل من US citizen مستحيل تسمح له يعترف بال retail fraud لازم محامي مثل ماريا take it down من retail fraud وقت تتعامل مع المدعي العام تحاول تقنع المدعي العام انه ينزلها يعمل بلي اقل من uh, retail fraud لانه retail fraud involves a crime of moral turpitude يعني هو كرايم بياثر على سلوك الانسان الاخلاقي او هو بيدل بالاحرى عن سلوك الانسان الاخلاقي سو so, انسان متهم بريتيل فراد هذا انسان مستحيل تنصحه انه يقبل بهالشيء لازم المحامي تبعه يشتغل فيري فيري هارد ليقلب التهمه لشيء اقل من هيك لكرايم ثاني بس منه اوف مورال تربيتود مثل مثلا ديستربينج ذا بيس او ام نوت شور وات ايلس مضبوط؟ نعم اكو اكو عده انواع الكرايمز البلي اجريمنتس اللي راح ياثرون على يعني دايركتلي راح ياثرون على الاميجريشن ستاتس كرايم انفولفينج مورال تربيتود هذا موجود بالقانون الهجره 
ومو يعني it's not very well defined ما ما محددين بالضبط شنو هو الكرايم انفولفينج مورال تربيتود فخلال القضايا اللي دخلت بالمحاكم قمنا نعرف شنو هي الكرايمز انفولفينج مورال تربيتود الانواع الكرايم وكمثل الريتيل فراد بميشيغان مو بكل ولايه بس بميشيغان يعتبروها ككرايم انفولفينج مورال تربيتود بس اكو بها اكسبشنز واذا الشخص اضطر ياخذ بلي اجريمنت لريتيل فراد لل ثيرد ديجري لو الفورث ديجري هذا ما راح ياثر على التقديم للجنسيه لو اذا الاثر ياثر التاثير راح يكون قليل بس اذا الشخص ياخذ سكند ديجري لو فيرست ديجري ريتيل فراد هذا راح ياثر طبعا احنا باي وقت ننصح الشخص اللي يريد ياخذ بلي اجريمنت اذا يقدر يغير الكرايم لو يشتغل ويا البروسيكيوتور يغير الكرايم بشكل بنوع كرايم انه ما تنحسب معروفه ما تنحسب هاي الكرايم يعتبروها كرايم انفولفينج مورال تربيتود راح يكون وضعه هوايه احسن آه بسبب انه يجوز ما يحتاج ينتظر خمس سنين يقدم على الجنسيه، يجوز يقدر يقدم اذا مؤهل آه راسا آه ورا ما تخلص البروبيشن مالته، بس اذا اخذ كرايم انفولفينج مورال تربيتود ومن انواع الكرايمز اللي تسوي ديبورتيشن لو توقف التقديم للجنسيه آه التاثير مالتها كلش هائل ولازم يحاول يقللها لو يغيرها لغير نوع كرايم ما تعتبر سي اي ام تي وهي هي النقطه انه وقت الانسان متهم بكرايم ذات انفولف مور توربيتود او كرايم ممكن تعرضه للترحيل او عدم الدخول هون المطلوب من المحامي الكريمنال ديفنس لوير مثل ماريا انه تحاول تقنع المدعي العام انه يقلب هيدي التهمه من تهمه غير مقبول فيها من ناحية الإيميغريشن لتهمة ما بتشكل خطر على هذا الإنسان نعم نعم وإضافة كيف. على هذا إذا المدعي العام قبل أنه يغير خلينا نقول من ريتيل فراد إلى خلينا نقول disorderly person وهي disorderly person مو crime involving moral turpitude فما راح تأثر على التقديم الجنسية ما يصير بالوقت اللي يطي لو يسوي البلي اجريمنت قدام القاضي يطي معلومات الريتيل فراد يعني اذا القاضي يقول اوكي قل لنا شنو هو اللي سويت اللي تخليك يعني ديسوردرلي بيرسون بس راح يريدون الفاكتس المعلومات اللي سووا بها الكريمنال تشارج وماريا can uh, can explain this uh, better I'll, I'll i'll have her uh, i'll ask her to do that soon um uh hay shagla ham tigdar ta'athir ala jinsiya lianahu bil qadaya al hijra khalin gul bil naturalization yqadrun yhatun al tuhma ala al shakhs wa al tuhma tkun kifaya li rafad qadaya al jinsiya يسموها ادميشن فاذا صارت ادميشن بالمحكمه انه ادميشن للالمنتس يعني انه سوى ريتيل فراد بس الكونفكشن صارت ديس اوردرلي بيرسون هذا هم يقدر ياثر على المعامله بطريقه سلبيه صحيح صحيح يعني يقدرون يرفضون المعامله يقدرون يرفضون الجنسيه اذا شخص قال اني سرقت من آه هذا المكان والسرقه آه كانت اكثر من 1000 دولار آه وما آه النيه مالتي كانت ما ردت ارجع الـ 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 هاي الـ الـ الغراض لهذا المحل آه هذني راح تكون الالمنتس اوف ذا كرايم فاذا الشخص قال هذا الشيء بالمقابله بالجنسيه لو بال قدام القاضي لما ياخذ البلي اجريمنت الحكومه الامريكيه الهجره تقدر تستعمل هذا الشيء ضده آه وتقول انه هو هي ادميت 
to retail fraud حتى لو اخذ plea agreement مع disorderly person اوكي قبل ما نسال ماريا تشرح لنا بالانجليزي شو الحل بيكون لكريمينال لو اتورني اللي انعرض على الموكل تبعه ديس اوردرلي كيف بيقدر يتجنب المدعي عليه تو ادميت تو ذا المنتس اوف ذا بيقول نو اي ديد نوت ستيل نو اي ديد نوت يو دونت استابلش ذا المنتس نو هو ما يقدر يكذب بالمحكمه سو so ما بيحكي فاكو طريقه الكريمينال اتورنيز يستعملون انه ما يخلون المدعي العام ولا القاضي يسال اسئله يخلي الشخص لازم يعطي معلومات بشنو هو اللي صار اوكي okay, uh, يعني not to incriminate himself بالضبط بالضبط and maria uh, what we are talking about is um, when uh, the defendant uh, should not be putting the facts of what happened on record because that can be counted as an admission for immigration purposes i, I believe there's a certain term uh, uh, that you use in criminal court for that yeah you have to put a to put the plea and have the plea be accepted the court has to accept the factual basis of the crime that you are uh, admitting to so if the cl- case is being pled from a retail fraud um, second down to a retail fraud third um, and and the issue for the immigration purposes is the amount of money and controversy or the amount of time that is um, uh, you know uh, required for the maximum possible jail sentence, we would want to take all that into consideration when formulating your factual basis for the plea. Well, it has to conform with the court rule. You have to place on the record what you did wrong and what you're pleading to. Um, We would have to make sure that we were able to put a factual basis that is going to also not going to disrupt your immigration status. So there's more than just making sure you get the plea that is going to keep your status in, in in the safe zone. It's also making sure when the plea is actually accepted by the court, it is done in a way that you are meeting both the court rule for the criminal court and not just undoing all that was done on your behalf to protect your status. But Maria, and, how do you achieve that? I'm so sorry, Sam. How do you achieve sure. that when you cannot tell the client to lie? So on no. one hand, you want to reduce his sentence from retail fraud to disorderly. On the other hand, the facts point to retail fraud, but you can't have him say that on the record because that would prove the element of retail fraud. So how? what do you tell the defendant to testify to without telling the defendant to lie, which is not something we as lawyers can do or are ever allowed to do? Right. So in those situations, if it's if it's if you're pleading to something that's almost the exact like a different charge altogether and you're unable to change the facts, right? You, so if you're not pleading from a retail fraud first degree down to a retail fraud third degree, then in that situation, you're now pleading to a disorderly conduct, which is a completely different statute. At that point, we would start talking to the prosecutor about a no contest plea, in which case you do not have to put a factual basis on the record. The judge may simply just read uh, the warrant request um, and we as the prosecutor and the defense attorney are able to stipulate that the factual basis is made by the uh, warrant request, but he's the client or she is pleading no contest to the, um, the, to the charge. Okay, understood. Uh, Sam and Maria, let's take a very quick break and we will be back. مكتب المحامية جمان كيروز يتضامن مع كافة الأشخاص الذين سيجدون صعوبة في تقديم طلبات الهجرة بسبب الارتفاع الكبير على رسوم التقديم على مختلف المعاملات ابتداء من الثاني أكتوبر المقبل ويقدم مكتب المحامية جمان كيروز خصما بقيمة 20% على كافة الخدمات القانونية لكافة معاملات التقديم على الجنسية خلال الشهر الجاري للمزيد من المعلومات 248-557-3645 Your rights, مع المحامية جمانة كيروس. عودة إلى برنامج Your Rights مع المحامية جمانة كيروس ونذكر بأرقام الهواتف في الاستوديو 313-769-6666-519-256-1023 جمانة نرجع لك شكرا رامي نحن اليوم حلقه مميزه وباذن الله بنعيدها نهار الاحد الساعه 7 بالليل عن تاثير 
تهمة إن كانت جنحة أو جناية على الإيميجريشن ستاتس تبع أي إنسان ونحكي عن الإنسان اللي بعد ما صار متجنس الإنسان اللي صار متجنس صار عنده حقوق مثله مثل كل إنسان تاني ما عدا حقوق إنه يصير رئيس جمهورية أمريكا لا أكثر ولا أقل وعم نحكي بعد شوي عن تأثير الفاميلي لا كيسز على الإيميجريشن ستاتس تبع أي إنسان اللي هو أقل من متجنس بدي أسأل المحامية ماريا بانشينكو وقت اللي الإنسان بيتهم بجنية أو جنحة مش مناسبة من الناحية الإيميجريشن ستاتس المدعي العام نحن بحاجة للكوابريشن تبع المدعي العام لننزل التهمة من شيء from an immigration status لا مقبول فيه إلى شيء آخر from an immigration status مقبول فيه كتير أوقات البروسيكيورر أو المدعي العام بيتعاطف معنا في بعض الأوقات المدعي العام بيرفض يا لأنه صعب المدعي العام يا لأنه المدعي عليه عنده تاريخ سابق سو لأسباب أو لأخرى أوقات المدعي العام ما بيرضى انه ينزل التهمه من شيء غير مقبول فيه الى شيء مقبول فيه، السؤال هو شو الحل هون؟ بتصير نادرا ما تصير بس بتصير، رح نسال المارية المحاميه ماريا بانشينكو عن هذا الموضوع، التوني ماريا بانشينكو اوكيجنالي وي كم اكروس بروسيكيورز هو ادمنتلي ريفيوز تو هيلب اس ريديوس ذا ذا تشارج from something that from an immigration standpoint is dangerous to something that from an immigration standpoint is okay. What do you do in that case when you have an unyielding prosecutor or maybe because the defendant has a, a rap sheet, a history, and, and the prosecutor is less likely to be amateur? What do you do in that case? Well, it, it it's, depends on the actual facts of the case. If, if it's something that I believe where the prosecutor is either does not have authority um, due to a policy of his office or her office, um, or if I feel that it's an issue where the prosecutor doesn't feel comfortable um, making the decision to reduce it, um, and is not just doing it um, for to be tough on the defendant or um, take a stance on that one in particular uh, crime, then what I'll do is, is um, I will consult with my client about submitting what we call a request to deviate from policy um, or a deviation request. And what we do is, is we write a letter to the, um, the, the prosecuting official that is uh, in whichever county that you're in or whichever city that you're in that is uh, responsible for deciding whether or not a specific set of circumstances or a specific case might be able to be considered to deviate from that prosecutor's position of um, or their policy where they normally would never allow a plea agreement in this situation, but because of the specific certain facts in your case, we're going to allow you a deviation from our regular policy and we'll go ahead and give you the plea agreement that you're looking for. It's, it's never a for sure. It's just a request and it has to be overlooked by um, you know, super people in supervisory capacities at prosecutor offices in order to make a, de a determination of whether or not they're going to, in fact, allow that to happen. It, it, it's a toss up in the air whether or not they're going to say yes or no. But it, in the situations of immigration, if you're running into a prosecutor that is not going to deviate from policy, um, it it's absolutely necessary to try to write that deviation letter and explain why you are asking for this uh, this p particular plea um, and explain the immigration issues that are involved so that the prosecutor that is able to review it can be fully aware of the situation and the reason why you're asking for it. Right. Assess the seriousness of the matter. Correct. And the consequences. And it, it's really, yeah, it's really not it, the prosecutor, unless you're talking about an extremely heinous crime, like a um, murder or criminal sexual conduct or something along these lines and all these different examples we've been giving today with, you know, theft crimes and DUIs, the prosecutor isn't out for their immigration status unless they're an absolute habitual offender. So that most of the time writing the deviation letter is, is worth, it's worth the time. It's worth the delay in your case. It's worth, um, 
you know, the extra money it might cost you to pay the attorney for additional time on your matter. If that's, if you're not going with a court appointed attorney, it's, it's definitely worth asking about in an immigration situation uh, where you have a prosecutor that's digging his heels in on a plea. And that's exactly what we hope to uh, send as a message today is to really drill it in our listeners' minds the very importance of consulting with an immigration attorney before you give your criminal defense attorney the green light on any plea deal. And only when your competent uh, immigration attorney gives you the green light should your criminal defense attorney, you know, uh, proceed with the matter. With the 12 minutes remaining, we want to talk about the interplay, if any, between family law and immigration law. There, too, we're talking about people who are not naturalized U.S. citizens yet. If you are a naturalized citizen, if you are naturalized, if you, are, if you have become a U.S. citizen, your rights like, is, are like everybody else in the United States. The only right you do not have that other U.S. citizens have is that you cannot run for United States Supreme Court. Uh, I mean, for the, I'm sorry, I have been following very closely the, uh, the, the congressional hearings <laughs> yeah. for the new nominee for the United States Supreme Court, and I have that on my mind. Uh, the only thing you cannot run for is for United States president. That's it. But other than that, you have the same rights. So let's talk about the interplay, if any, between people who come to you, they are asylees, they are visitors, they are, they have a student visa, they have a work visa, uh, they have a fiancé visa, and I don't know, they have a custody issue. Um, on a fiancé visa, obviously you're not married yet, but let's say you have a green card and you want to annul your marriage, or you want to get divorced, and you already have a green card, and whether that may jeopardize your immigration status because what you're dreaming of right now is, you know, becoming a U.S. citizen. I'm going to have Sam talk in English and then talk in Arabic. And, and I know, Maria, you sent those two to Sam to get clearance again from him it, it, before yes. you proceed. It's the exact same thing as we've said with the criminal cases. If someone calls me for a divorce or any of the issues you were just discussing, custody, annulment, and they mention that they have anything less than U.S. citizenship um, and they are on an immigration status, even if it's a green card, I immediately send them to Sam because I just don't know what getting a divorce or what a custody agreement or what uh, annulment or anything in my capacity, child support, spousal support. I don't know how this could affect them and their status because I'm. it's such a specialized area of law. You need to consult with an immigration attorney before calling a divorce attorney or a family attorney for any of your family law matters just to make sure that none of these things will touch your immigration status. Yes, but just to be clear, Maria, you do this because that's what a good family law attorney does. You don't yeah. do this because you're required to do it. The case, yeah. the 2011 Fedella versus Holder United States Supreme Court case, is about criminal proceedings. It's not Correct. about family law proceedings. Correct. I do okay. that because I want to make sure that I'm protecting my client and not right. doing something that could possibly or potentially affect their status. Right. Sam? Yes. Um, right. So uh, uh, the, f f one of the first things that can affect someone's status in family law would be divorce, um, divorce or annulment. Um, if someone is uh, here in the U.S. Uh, on a green card, let's say, um, and they got that green card uh, through marriage, through marriage. Uh, uh, sometimes a divorce can affect their case. Um, and in certain times, uh, so can annulment. Um, uh, for someone who's on a conditional green card, um, they, uh, if they get a divorce and, uh, you know, in, in parts of the divorce, uh, they, they, uh, you know, let the, the judge know that maybe the, the marriage wasn't real to begin with, that it was, uh, maybe it was done for a green card, um, that can affect their case. And that's now public record. Uh, now, obviously someone might not put, uh, uh in the, in the, uh, family law complaint that they, um, uh, got married solely uh, to get a, a green card, uh, but that information may come out later on from the other side, and that can affect the case. 
uh, their their green card case later on. Um, in addition, if somebody is has applied for asylum and they are a derivative of their spouse's asylum application, once they get divorced, that can significantly affect uh, their ability to get asylum through their spouse. Um, uh, if they don't have a, an asylum case there themselves, uh, or a story good enough for an asylum case themselves, uh, they, they might be subject to deportation. Um, so that's, that's another place where it would affect it. Um, uh, also, uh, if somebody decides to get an annulment rather than a divorce, uh, for someone who received their green card through marriage, uh, those types of cases, um, uh, they basically, uh, in getting an annulment, you're basically saying this marriage uh, never happened or never should have happened, uh, or maybe it was invalid. Um, and so when you do that, uh, that can affect your green card because then maybe you should not have gotten your green card uh, based on uh, that particular um, uh, marriage. Um, and, uh, you know, adding to that, uh, if somebody gets married here in the U.S. Uh, but uh, never got divorced uh, back home, uh, they could be considered to have an invalid marriage uh, and that can affect their immigration status. So there are whole different types of uh, cases that are affected uh, in family and immigration law. Sam, may I ask you, and I know we didn't talk about this when preparing the show, but I just remembered I have a case, too, where if you do get divorced and you are the sponsor, um, my client being the sponsor of his um, of his spouse coming over, um, once the divorce is ended, that, that sponsorship, they continue to have to keep them above the poverty line. Is that correct? Yes, technically that is true. So basically, um, the sponsorship in immigration cases, are, it's a contract between the sponsor and the U.S. government. And the contract basically says um, that the, the sponsor has to continue to sponsor the person until they become a U.S. citizen, until they pass away, until they work uh, for, for 10 years and obtain 40 credit hours, um, or if they lose their green card, or if they uh, leave the United States permanently. So uh, those are the only five ways uh, sponsorship ends. It doesn't matter if they're divorced. Now, practically speaking, the U.S. government uh, previously had not tried to go after sponsors um, to obtain any uh, government uh, uh, or, or reimbursement of government benefits uh, the, the green card holder has received. Uh, they're talking about doing that now, um, and, and it hasn't been implemented yet, but they are talking about it. And from what I understand, Maria, uh, in, in many cases, when you talk about spousal support, um, a lot of family law judges uh, do implement the sponsorship as part of the uh, divorce agreement and, uh, you know, include some sort of monetary assistance uh, in those uh, uh, final judgments. Yes, I've had a judge just um, very uh, eager to do that. And I've had other judges that, ref you know, they just say I can't override the, you know, the United States uh, Immigration Office's uh, authority on this matter. And, you know, sometimes it can be very upsetting for clients that they have to continue to pay even for short term marriages. It looks like spousal support. Yes, yes. Well, uh, technically, the affidavit of support the way the agreement is written is that they will not let the uh, green card holder become a public charge. Um, uh, but they're, it's not really defined as to how they're going to support them. Uh, it's just that they uh, promise that the, uh, uh, the government, they would reimburse the government if uh, the person became a public charger or received certain types of uh, government assistance. Now, how that plays into family court, it's actually a, a, a gray area. Um, as I'm sure you know, it's uh, most uh, judges don't know how to deal with the affidavit of support because of the way that it's written. It's not very clear um, whether they should use it uh, to, to order a specific amount of support to keep them above the federal poverty guidelines or whether to just allow the U.S. government to uh, seek reimbursement 
for somebody who obtains government assistance. Exactly. And that is true. It's very much a gray area in the family courts. Different judges do different things with that uh, affidavit of support. Uh, we have four minutes remaining. Sam, can you translate into Arabic uh, what what dangerous areas in family law might negatively, adversely affect somebody's pending green card or pending naturalization, etc.? You talked about the first one, which we have um, heard about before. If someone comes here and gets uh, let's say her green card um, mm -hmm. through marriage, and then after the green card gets divorced, but before she becomes a U.S. citizen, it might arouse the suspicion of USCIS that this was never a legitimate marriage in the first place. I just want you to answer this in Arabic and talk about, with the three minutes remaining, everything else. نعم كل كل شخص اللي ادى جرين كارد اللي يجوز يريد يحصل طلاق لازم يحكي ويا محامي هجره لانه راح يجوز تاثر على الاميجريشن ستاتس مالته على الجرين كارد اذا ما عدى الجرين كارد الدائمي الجرين كارد اللي بس السنتين راح ياثر على المعامله لما يقدم الفورم اي 751 ريموفل اوف كونديشنز هذا نوع القضية اللي يخلي الشخص يحصل الجرين كارد الدائمي وإضافة على هذا أي شخص اللي موجود بالولايات المتحدة لنوع فيزا مو بس جرين كارد بس نوع فيزا كسباوس لشخص مثل ال H one B السباوس مالت ال H two يقدر يبقى لو إذا student فيزا ال F two يقدر يبقى كسباوس um, إذا جاي على asylum derivative um, uh, هذول الناس إذا يحصلون طلاق يجوز ما يقدرون يجددون الستاتس مالتهم أكثر الوقت ما راح يقدرون لازم يدورون غير ستاتس الشخص اللي spouse of H2B إذا طلق لازم يرجع البلدة uh, الشخص على ال F2 visa هي student visa بس spouse of student visa إذا يطلق لازم يرجع البلدة فتعتمد على نوع الفيزا ستاتس مع الاشخاص وشنو هي الاجراءات اللي يريدون ياخذوها بالاميجريشن كورت العفو بالفاملي كورت ويعني التاثير اللي راح يصير عليه اذا لازم يطلعون البلد لو لازم يقدمون معامله جديده للهجره كل هذا تعتمد يعني بطريقة سريعة عنا أقل من دقيقة لنقول شخص عنده H1 فيزا زوجته عنده H4 إذا زوجته طلقته مفروض تترك البلد لأنه her visa is derivative من الفيزا تبعه صحيح واو نتمنى أنه نكون اليوم وصلنا فكرة واحدة للمستمعين أنه أي إنسان بعد ما صار يؤس سيتيزن إذا عنده أي مشاكل جنائية أو جنحة أو فاميلي لا من الضروري جدا يتكلم مع محامي للهجرة ليعطيه كليرنس ليعطيه الابروفل ليشرح له قبل ما يخطي أي خطوة بتخص ملفه إن كريمينال لا أو ملفه إن فاميلي لا بكرة بنحكي عن حوادث السيارات لمدة ساعة Thank you so very much attorneys Maria Panchenko and Sam Saif This was really very